Hi, everyone, this is the Encyclopedia Channel. The book interpreted by this program is called Rich People Are Different From What You Think. This is a best-selling book, and it has a high score on the reading platform. It ranks high on the list of investment and financial management, and its popularity remains high. So, what is it about this book that draws so much attention? Why does the author place special emphasis on wealth blueprint and what does it mean? To realize this blueprint, what efforts do we have to make? After listening to the interpretation of this book, I believe everyone will understand. Rich People Are Not What You Think is a book about getting rich, and it puts forward a very unique point of view on how to get rich. It is an issue related to people's wealth status and affects people's economic status. Speaking of this issue, you may have noticed a phenomenon. In reality, some people seem to have the talent to make money, such as some entrepreneurs, no matter how hard they are, their careers are ups and downs, and they are still rich in the end, while some people seem to have no wealth luck, and they cannot grasp the opportunity to make money, occasionally make money, and may lose it quickly, and in the end it is inevitable to be mediocre, or even poor. What caused the gap between the two? Is it education, IQ, occupation, or character? This book tells us neither. People's wealth status is not directly related to these, the real reason comes from another source. Simply put, this book argues that each of us has a subconscious wealth blueprint that acts like a thermostat to determine each individual's earning power and financial situation. If the wealth blueprint is large enough, even if you have no money, you will become rich. If the wealth blueprint is too small, even if you have money, you will become poor. In order to have a good wealth blueprint, you must get rid of many pedantic concepts about money and change your way of thinking and behavior. Only in this way can it be possible to achieve financial success and move towards wealth freedom. The author of this book, Harvey Eck, is the founder of a training company in the United States and has no celebrity aura. This book has received long-term attention because it tells the plight of many people on wealth issues and provides a new way of thinking and action guidelines so that people can be motivated and inspired to pursue greater freedom of wealth. That's what it's worth. Next, read this book in three parts. First of all, let's look at what the wealth blueprint repeatedly emphasized by the author means and why it is very important for getting rich. The second part is about the way of thinking that a person should establish in order to realize the wealth blueprint. Finally, the third part is about to realize the wealth blueprint, what behavior habits should a person develop. Together, these three parts cover the beliefs, thinking and actions about getting rich, hoping to inspire or inspire everyone. First part. What exactly is a wealth blueprint and why it's so important to getting rich? Let's look at the author's explanation first. He said in the book, what is a wealth blueprint? Just like an architectural blueprint is the plan or design you made before building a house, a wealth blueprint is your plan or attitude towards money. Your wealth blueprint contains your thoughts, feelings, and actions about money. This is the original sentence, which sounds a bit abstract and vague at first glance. But it doesn't matter, the author made an analogy next, and it will be easy for us to understand. The author said that a person's wealth blueprint is like a thermostat for a room. If the indoor temperature is 27 degrees, it means that the setting of the controller is 27 degrees. At this time, if the window is opened, cold air comes in, and the indoor temperature drops to 13 degrees, the regulator will operate to adjust the room temperature to 27 degrees. Of course, it is also possible that the hot air blowing in from the outside raises the room temperature to 33 degrees. At this time, the controller will also operate and adjust the room temperature back to 27 degrees. What does it mean? That is to say, a person's wealth status depends on the wealth goals he sets for himself. Whether it's 350 million or 100,800, the money a person can earn is probably the goal he sets for himself. If you are lucky and the money you earn exceeds the set goal, you will not be able to keep the money, and you will leave him sooner or later. If you are unlucky and you lose a lot of money, it is only a temporary bad luck, and you will eventually be able to earn it back. In the words of the author, your income can only increase as much as you most want to do. The author gave an example. Former U.S. President Trump has had many ups and downs in business. He originally had a net worth of billions of dollars, but later lost money in a mess, but made his money back a few years later, even richer than before. Why is this? 
The author believes that Trump's wealth thermostat is different from that of ordinary people. In other words, a rich man with a successful career may lose his wealth, but the most important factor for his success will not be lost, which is the rich man's head. Similar cases are everywhere, and it is not uncommon for entrepreneurs who have been heavily indebted in their startups to make a comeback. Even in life, we will see that some people seem to be born good at making money, no matter how much they struggle, they will end up in a good financial situation, light. The author believes that this is the role of the wealth blueprint or wealth thermostat. You may ask, can a wealth blueprint really determine a person's wealth? What is the reason behind it? The author's explanation is simple. He believes that the world is connected by cause and effect, wealth is a result, poverty is a result, just like health is a result, and illness is also a result. If you want to change the effect, you must change the cause. If you want to get rich, you must have the idea of getting rich. Thinking produces feelings, feelings produce actions, and actions produce results. This series of procedures is what he calls a wealth thermostat, or a wealth blueprint, what a person's wealth blueprint looks like determines his financial status. The author believes that in reality, most people's wealth thermostat is set at thousands or tens of thousands of dollars, not millions, some people only set it at a few hundred dollars, and some people set it at sub-zero, was dying of cold, but did not understand why he was freezing. If you want to permanently change the room temperature, the only way is to reset the thermostat. In the same way, if you want to completely change your financial situation, you must reset your wealth goals, which is your wealth blueprint. In the words of the author, your income can only increase as much as you most want to do. How to understand this sentence? It has three key words, which can help us understand the meaning of wealth blueprint more deeply. One is most willing. We all know that making money is not easy, and it is even more difficult to make a lot of money. One cannot become rich without a desire to become rich. To put it to the extreme, even if the pie falls from the sky, you have to bend down to pick it up, even if you buy a lottery ticket to win the jackpot, you still have to buy the lottery ticket first. So the premise of getting rich is to want to get rich, and the desire must be very strong, reaching the level of most willing, so that you can persevere and go all out for it. For example, it is mentioned in the book that one of the author's students wants to make a lot of money because he wants to fund a charity that saves AIDS patients. Beliefs like these outlast ordinary motivation. Because ordinary people want to improve their lives by making money, it can only be said to be a wish, and it has not yet reached the level of most willing. The second is do it. We mentioned earlier that a person's wealth status depends on the setting of the wealth thermostat. This is easy to misunderstand. Does it mean that any wealth goal set can be achieved? Of course not. Because you not only have to set goals, but also do what should be done. For example, if you draw a very special wealth blueprint, first set a goal of 10 million US dollars. Are you talking about it or are you doing it? Are you impulsive or persistent? Do you try casually or go all out? The word achieve is very important, and the effort must be worthy of the goal. The third is only. That is to say, one's goals should not be too high, nor should one underestimate oneself, but should match one's own abilities. This ability is both innate and acquired, both internal and external. For example, many people know that the parents of Bill Gates and Buffett have strong backgrounds. Gates' mother knew the chairman of IBM, and Buffett's father was a member of Congress. Their wealth blueprint is definitely different from that of ordinary people, and this difference is not only due to innate conditions, but also the result of acquired learning and hard work. But in any case, it will not be too far from my own ability conditions. In short, please remember that your income can only increase to the extent that you are most willing to achieve, the wealth blueprint is not only a simple numerical goal, but also a system including belief, thinking and action. The difference between rich people and ordinary people is systematic, including whether they have a positive or negative attitude towards getting rich, whether their actions to make money are wavering or firm, whether their desire for money is instinctive or based on faith, and so on. These cannot be summarized by a simple number, nor can they be changed in the short term. Therefore, the wealth blueprint has a fundamental impact on people's wealth status and can act as a thermostat. The second part. Of course, we all know that it is not enough to have goals in order to achieve success, but also to have correct ideas and methods. 
So next we will talk about what kind of thinking a person should have in order to realize the wealth blueprint. In this book, the author summarizes 17 different ways of thinking and behaviors between the rich and the poor, and sets up a blueprint for wealth for everyone. However, due to space limitations, we can only focus on interpretation. Here are two more important ways of thinking. In order to reduce negative emotions, the word poor in the original book is replaced by ordinary people below. The first is about the mentality of making money. The author believes that the mentality of the rich is different from that of ordinary people. The rich always want to win, but ordinary people are always afraid of losing. Therefore, the rich will focus on opportunities, while ordinary people will focus on obstacles. This leads to different actions and outcomes. We've all heard the famous question, is a glass half empty or half full? From this, we can see that rich people think differently from ordinary people. When rich people see a half glass of water, they will think about finding another half glass of water. When ordinary people see a half glass of water, they worry about losing the half glass of water. For the same thing, what the rich see is growth potential. What ordinary people see is the possibility of losing money. Rich people care about how much reward they will get, while ordinary people care about how much risk they have. In short, rich people focus on opportunities, ordinary people focus on obstacles. One has to change this mentality if one wants to become rich. Why is changing your mindset so important? The author tells us that what you focus on expands, a person who focuses on opportunities sees opportunities, and focuses on obstacles to discover obstacles. Rich people focus on opportunities, and for them there are opportunities everywhere, ordinary people focus on obstacles, and they see everything as an obstacle. That's why rich people like to experiment, try this for a while, and try that for a while, while ordinary people are always on the sidelines, worrying about this for a while, and complaining about that for a while. As a result, the rich are always on the move, while the common man is on the sidelines. Action is important because anything of value, including luck, is revealed after action. Regardless of people's work or luck, they don't move forward in a straight line, but like a meandering river. Usually, you can only see the next bend in the river, and you have to walk across to see more sights. So the author puts forward a concept called step into the corridor, that is, if you are interested in an opportunity, step in first. If you don't step into the corridor, you will never know what door will open to you. There is such a story in the book. A few years ago, the author wanted to open a pastry coffee shop, but had no experience, so he went to work in a bakery. Trying to get close to the manager, getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning to work as an assistant to the baker, and doing everything possible to understand the knowledge and information of the industry. Later, his own cake shop did not open, but he got acquainted with the bakers in the shop. Unexpectedly, this person called him soon after, saying that he had discovered a hot new sports equipment, and asked him if he was interested in being a distributor. The author took a look and felt that the opportunity had come, so he decided to invest in it. It turned out that this opportunity allowed him to become the owner of a fitness equipment chain store and earn his first $1 million in his life. Therefore, the author believes that action is always better than no action. Only in action can you learn more knowledge, meet more people, and even discover unexpected opportunities. It is precisely because of the different attitudes towards risks and opportunities that rich people focus on opportunities and try them when they see opportunities, so the probability of success in the end is high, while ordinary people focus on risks, look forward and backward when they see opportunities, and are always on the sidelines, so follow get rich always pass by. The second is about the way to make money. The book points out that rich people often get paid according to results, while ordinary people choose to get paid according to time. These two different ways of earning will also lead to huge differences in wealth. In reality, most people are paid a fixed salary, and everyone likes it that way. Why? On the one hand, they are influenced by their elders. Almost everyone has heard similar advice from their parents, go to school well, get good grades, find a good job, and have a stable salary, and you will live happily ever after. Of course, for most people, they can receive a fixed salary at a fixed time every month to support themselves and their families. This sense of security is also very comfortable. However, the author pointed out that because people's time is limited, if they are paid according to working hours, their income must also be limited.
This violates one of the principles of getting rich, don't set limits on your income. While a steady salary can bring security, it can also prevent you from making more money. In contrast, most rich people are paid according to results, such as sales commissions, transaction commissions, profit sharing, royalties for works, etc. which are linked to work performance or transaction results. These incomes are unstable, but they have no upper limit, so they can make rich people. In the business world, returns and risks are highly correlated. If you want to be rich, you have to take certain risks, from getting a fixed salary based on the hours work to getting unstable returns based on the results of your work. But this is unacceptable to most people. In the eyes of the older generation, a job without a fixed salary is not a job, so when the author started his business, his parents asked him, when will you find a real job? His answer was, I hope forever no. His mother was about to collapse when she heard that. Fortunately, his father understood him and supported his choice, thus avoiding more family conflicts. The author believes that it is difficult to get rich when paid by the hour, so it is suggested that people who receive a fixed salary can negotiate with their employers to allow part of their remuneration to be calculated according to the results of their work, otherwise they can consider becoming their own boss. You can start with a part-time job first, such as be a coach or teacher in a certain industry, impart knowledge and experience to others, or provide independent consulting services to companies, but pay based on results rather than time. In any case, Creating conditions that allow you to earn income based on the results of your work rather than the hours you work is a key step towards getting rich. In addition, the author emphasizes that passive income must be created in addition to work income, that is, income that will naturally increase over time, such as interest, rent, royalties, etc. Otherwise, there will never be financial freedom. Of course, this involves how to accumulate work income and engage in investment. This is a special and important topic which will not be discussed here due to space limitations. If you are interested, you can check out the original book. The third part. According to the definition of this book, the realization of the wealth blueprint includes a series of procedures, thoughts generate feelings, feelings generate actions, and actions generate results. We have already talked about the beliefs and thinking of getting rich, and finally let's look at what behavior habits a person needs to develop in order to realize the blueprint for wealth. Because this book is more macroscopic, it may be called Principles of Action. Therefore, next, I will introduce three principles of action for getting rich, or macro-behavioral habits. First, go all out for what you are looking for. As mentioned earlier, a person's wealth status depends on the goals he sets, which is the core of the wealth blueprint. But at the same time, it is pointed out that the so-called goal is not just talk, but a real commitment to it. It should be noted that the author emphasizes that commitment means unreservedly, wholeheartedly, willing to do everything that should be done for it, devote all the time that should be paid, and put everything into it. Because obviously, getting rich isn't as simple as going for a run in the park. There are billions of people all over the world who want to get rich, but very few of them actually succeed. If you don't go all out, why will you succeed? Someone said, I am as tired as a dog every day, am I not working hard enough? Of course I am working on becoming rich. But in the author's opinion, many people think that their efforts are far from enough. For example, would you like to work 16 hours a day? Would you like to work 7 days a week with no weekends off? Are you willing to sacrifice time with family and friends, and give up leisure and entertainment? Are you willing to invest all of your time, energy and capital with no guarantee of return? This is commonplace for many rich people. It is precisely because most people cannot do their best to work, so when asked, would you swear with your life that you will become a rich man in 10 years? Most people won't say yes, because they subconsciously don't want to work and make money with all their might. In the author's opinion, only by working hard wholeheartedly and unreservedly to the determined goal can there be a possibility of success. Second, do not blame, complain, or make excuses for everything. The author mentioned in the book that ordinary people often play the role of victims compared with rich people. This role is characterized by a fondness for blaming, complaining, and making excuses. People who usually have these characteristics are also losers in business activities. They blame the economy, the government, the industry, their boss, their partners, their family, their friends, and their parents. 
Anyway, mistakes are always someone else's, not your own. If you make a mistake, you can find a bunch of excuses. This practice of blaming, complaining, and making excuses, at best, relieves momentary stress and anxiety about failure, but fundamentally makes things worse. Why? As mentioned earlier, what you focus on expands. When you complain, you're definitely focusing on what's wrong in your life rather than what's right, and according to the law of attraction like attracts like, you'll see more mistakes. In other words, when you complain, you are actually attracting more bad things into your life. So, every time you blame someone, make excuses, or complain, you're killing your chances of getting rich. So the author suggests that every time you find yourself doing this, you must remind yourself in some form that this is pushing yourself into a predicament and you must stop immediately. This may seem arbitrary, but it stops us from blaming others, making excuses, or complaining about society, and helps us reduce these harmful habits and move more away from failure and closer to success. Third, stay humble and keep learning. The author believes that on the road to wealth, there are three most dangerous words, namely I know. According to his experience, rich people are mostly curious about the world and have the habit of continuous learning, while ordinary people think that there is nothing new in the world, as if they know everything. But in fact, if you are still troubled by financial problems, then you must have a lot to learn about wealth and life. When the author was young, there was a period of poverty. But fortunately, once he met a wealthy friend of his father, the senior told him during the conversation, if you don't achieve the success you want, there are some things you don't know yet. This sentence inspired him and made him change from a person who thought he knew everything to a person who wanted to learn everything, and he achieved a huge transformation in the following career. Why is continuous learning and growth so important? From a practical point of view, it is obvious that experts in a certain field will be rich, while ordinary people are mediocre in their field of work. Regardless of whether you are a boss or a technician, whether you receive a commission or a fixed salary, whether you invest in stocks or real estate, it can almost be said that the higher a person's professional level, the higher the reward for his work. Therefore, continuous learning and continuous improvement of professional skills are the basic ways for a person to increase income and accumulate wealth. From a philosophical point of view, nothing in the world is static, and every real thing is constantly changing. Especially in society, after the arrival of the new technological revolution, knowledge updates are advancing by leaps and bounds, and industries are undergoing earth-shaking changes. If we do not maintain the habit of lifelong learning, we will soon be abandoned by the development of society. Therefore, the author believes that the fundamental way for a person to become rich and keep his wealth is to maintain humility, keep learning, and keep growing. Now, let's review the core point of this book. Everyone has a blueprint of wealth in their minds, which is like a thermostat that determines everyone's earning power and financial status. Of course, it is not only a simple numerical goal, but also a comprehensive system including belief, thinking and action. In other words, in order for this regulator to be effective, you have to get rid of those pedantic ideas about money and establish new thinking patterns and behavior habits, including taking risks, shifting from focusing on obstacles to focusing on opportunities, and maintaining lifelong learning, etc. Wait. In the original book, the author sums up 17 ways of thinking and acting about getting rich, and all of them are presented in a contrasting way between rich and poor, which is impressive. For example, it mentioned that rich people play money games to win, and ordinary people play money games to not lose, and rich people can make money work hard for them, etc. Very intriguing. The last thing I want to remind is that at the beginning of this book, the author Harvey Eck tells the readers, don't believe a word I say. What does this mean? It reflects a basic attitude of the author, that is, anyone's point of view is the opinion of the whole family, and you can refer to it for reference, but you cannot accept it as it is. Including the concepts and cognitions put forward in this book, there is no absolute right or wrong, it just reflects the author's experience and perspective, and we should not easily affirm or deny it. Instead of blindly believing or denying it, it is better to try repeatedly through actions, and finally use practical results to test the true and false, in order to create success in the real world. From this perspective, it can be said that open thinking coupled with decisive action is the key to determining wealth in life. We are here to wish you all the early realization of financial freedom. This is the end of this episode of the show. What do you think about it differently?
Welcome to leave a message to discuss with everyone. Hey, if you like our channel, please subscribe us. Haha, <laughs> remember to like it.